Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the DAS RCN webinar on distributed acoustic sensing at the ocean bottom. I'm Casey Adderholt, speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, DC. IRIS is a consortium of universities and an NSF-funded science facility operating programs that enable Earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophysics, particularly in seismology. This webinar will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science Presentation webinar YouTube channel. Should you have a qu comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box, on your Zoom control panel. At the end, we'll read your name and question to the presenter. If similar questions have been asked, we may combine or skip them. If the webinar happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, we will reboot it. Just click the webinar link again. Automatic closed captions are available to turn on during the Zoom session. Use of distributed acoustic sensing is rapidly expanding in our community, prompting the initiation of a research coordination network to facilitate workshops, tutorials, and other opportunities for sharing ideas and resources. This one is one in a planned series of webinars on different topics within distributed acoustic sensing. I'm going to pass this to the lead of the Marine Geophysics DAS RCN Working Group, Dr. Nate Lindsay, now to introduce our speaker today and moderate the webinar. Thanks, Casey. Um, so I, my name is Nate Lindsay. I'm a lead scientist in geophysics at FiberSense, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Itzhak Lior. Uh, Itzhak had uh, obtained his bachelor's degree for, in physics and geology from Hebrew University in 2013, and then uh, continued to Tel Aviv University where he earned his master's and PhD uh, in seismology. In his PhD, he worked on developing new source uh, parameter determination schemes and physics-based ground motion prediction and earthquake early warning. He's now a postdoc uh, Geo Azure, uh, where he's working with Anthony Sladen, Diane Reve, and Jean-Paul Ampuero. Uh, and in this postdoc, he's been working, um, doing a lot of really interesting work looking at underwater DAS measurements, which we'll be speaking about today. Um, the relationship to actual ground motion measurements that we've made with uh, inertial sensors, for example, um, and also early warning feasibility, shallow submarine imaging, and more. Uh, in July, ITSAC will be uh, returning to Hebrew University as a senior lecturer. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, Nate, for the introduction. Um, can you hear me and see the screen? I yes, sure no. can. Okay, cool, thanks. So um, I'm going to present some results of what we've been doing here in uh, GeoAzur. So GeoAzur is the Earth Science Laboratory associated with the Université Côte d'Azur in South France. And I'm going to show you results from our work on distributed acoustic sensing applications at the ocean bottom. So first of all, I want to acknowledge the GeoAzur uh, dust team, already quite a few people, uh, Anthony Sladen, Diane Rive, and Jean-Paul Ampuero. We have two postdocs, Martin van den Ende and myself, and several PhD students. Uh, I also want to acknowledge EMSO for aiding us in uh, getting access to the infrastructure and the cables that we used in this study. And the dust equipment, the interrogators that we used were manufactured by uh, Thebus Optics and Aragon Photonics. So I can't really give a dust talk without saying a few words about how this new technology works. <clears throat> so we can think of a fiber as this, elastic as this plastic rod where a light source is introduced to one end of the fiber. Most of the light, as you can see, exits on this end of the fiber, but some of the light is backscattered towards the source. And this backscattered light is a result of many density anomalies, many heterogeneities within the fiber itself that interact with the laser pulse. Now, by analyzing the backscattered light, we can resolve strain or strain rate deformations along the fiber um, along tens of kilometers of fibers. So the setup is as follows. We have a dust interrogator with a laser source that sends pulses along this fiber. This can be any standard telecommunication fibers used for internet or communications. When a seismic wavefront, seismic or acoustic wavefront sweeps across the fiber, it actually causes the fiber to stretch and elongate. Um, this actually changes the heterogeneity stru structure within the fiber. 
And by analyzing the backscattered pattern at a single position along the fiber between two instances in time, we can resolve the, the formations along the fiber. This is an example of one fiber <clears throat> that we used offshore Toulon, south of France. The interrogator was placed on this end of the fiber on land, and we were able to obtain seismic measurements every 10 meters along this almost 48 kilometer fiber. So roughly 4,800 seismic channels. And we see that the uh, bottom of the fiber is at a water depth of two and a half kilometers. So by simply plugging in the interrogator on the on-land end of the fiber, we were able to resolve seismic deformations at a depth of two and a half kilometers beneath the ocean surface. So why do we want to implement this technology on the ocean bottom? And we can easily understand the motivation if we look at the uh, current distribution of seismic sensors around the world. And this is an example from the Mediterranean region. We have a very significant bias of uh, seismic observations. We can almost only obtain seismic measurements on land. Here we have uh, in red triangles, the locations of seismic uh, instruments. Most of them are on land, very few are on the water. The main reason is that installing and maintaining ocean bottom seismometers or OBS is very costly and thus not widely implemented. But if we will be able to use at least some of the infrastructure that is already deployed on the bottom of our oceans. In this case, I'm talking about uh, internet cables, telecommunication cables that cover the vast majority of the Mediterranean in this example. If we will be able to use at least part of these cables for seismic measurements, we would fill in this vast observational gap. I do have to say that currently we're limited by the first repeater. There are repeaters along these fibers to enhance um, the, size, the signal, um, roughly at 50 to 100 kilometers. That's the current limitation, but hopefully in the future with technological advances, this limitation will be lifted. Here we have another map of the deployment of fibers around the world, and we see that vast sections of our oceans are covered by these fibers. Just to give you a feeling of how they look like, um, this is an example of a fiber that's used for underwater telecommunications. It has to withstand, withstand very harsh conditions, so it's very uh, heavy, armored to protect it. Um, in this talk, I'm going to show you several potential applications of underwater dust. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to show results from earthquake and ambient noise measurements and source parameter estimation and earthquake early warning, basically how we can use this new technology to, um, for hazard mitigation purposes for early warning. In the second part, I'm going to show you an example of how we can use these measurements, ambient noise recorded on dust, to image underwater structures. And throughout the talk, I'm going to present, shortly present a few other things that we are working on here in Jerusalem. So just to say a few words about the ability to track ships using these fibers. And this is an example from a paper that was recent, recently published by uh, Diane Rivet. Here we have a ship that is passing above the fiber. In this case that we see here, that fiber is 85 meters beneath the ship. We can clearly see the signal in the time series. When we look at the PSD frequency as a function of time, we see several harmonics that are activated when the ship passes above the fiber. These harmonics are mainly uh, as a result of the ship's mechanical operations, the engine. Uh, we can see here the Doppler shift of the frequencies emitted by the ship when it's traveling towards the fiber, the frequencies decrease. And again, when it's pulling away from the fiber, we see that the frequencies continue to decrease. So now let's talk about what we can measure, how we can measure earthquakes and ambient noise using these fibers and how we can use them for magnitude estimation and eventually earthquake early warning. So there were previous studies that showed that we can quite reliably measure seismic signals and earthquakes on these fibers. This is an example from uh, Lindsay 2019 and IDE, a paper that took, came out in the previous weeks. We see here, time as a function of distance along the fiber. We can clearly see P wave arrival. Here we have the S wave arrival, a very coherent seismic wave field that is recorded by this fiber. And uh, in this example from EDIA, we have the, the P wave arrival that is very clearly visible here and the S wave, wave arrival. In these cases, we see the seismic signals almost on every position along the fiber. 
because these fibers are well coupled to the ground. And in some sections, they are even buried beneath the sediments. But that is not always the case, especially with fibers that are not intended for seismology. And this is an example from Slade in 2019, the same fiber that I showed you before, offshore Toulon. Some sections of this fiber record very high quality, high amplitude signals. Other sections record very low amplitude signals. And again, another example from Greece, high amplitude signals and low amplitude signals. And the reason that we have such a significant differences between different positions along the fiber, and then we have a short movie, is that when the fiber is deployed, it's not meant for seismological purposes. And we have a few ways to deploy these fibers. The first one is to drop the cable from the ship. It enters this plow that buries the fiber as it's being deployed. Another approach is to bury the fiber after it's being deployed using an ROV. But vast sections of optical fibers are not really um, buried into the ground. They are deployed from the ship with a certain amount of slack. And this slack is supposed to ensure good coupling between the fiber and the ocean bottom. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. When we look using an ROV at one of our cables that's deployed to offshore Greece, we see that in some sections it really does touch the ground and we expect to see very high quality seismic signals. But in vast sections of the fiber, we have images like these where the fiber is not touching the ground and is hanging over these cliffs and rocks. In spite of these problems, we're still able to use these fibers for seismic measurements and I'm going to show the next slide. So the data that I'm going to uh, use here uh, from three different cables deployed in the Mediterranean, one offshore Toulon and two offshore Greece near Metoni. We have here the bathymetrical profiles of these fibers. So the one in Toulon we already saw around uh, 48, sorry, uh, 44 kilometers goes as deep as two and a half kilometers beneath the sea level. We have two shorter cables in Greece. This one, 26 kilometers goes very deep, water depth of four kilometers. So again, when we plug in the interrogator only in the on land end of the fiber, we are able to resolve seismic deformations very deep beneath the ocean surface. Now, we started out by looking at the noise content that's recorded by our dust uh, cables. Here we have uh, noise power spectral densities, PSDs, log frequency as a function of distance along the fiber. These two fibers are from Greece, this one in Toulon. You can see that the horizontal axis is different because the fibers have different lengths. And we already see a few interesting features. We see secondary micro seismics here in Toulon. We see surface gravity waves at around 0.1 Hertz in all three fibers here, here, and here. And we see resonance of short waves in a shallow sedimentary basin here and here at around one to four Hertz. And later on, I'm going to show you how we can use this ambient noise to resolve this, the geological structure beneath the fiber in this position. There's another interesting pattern that you can see here. These sections are actually vibrating due to um, underwater currents. These sections are not well coupled to the ground. They are hanging in the middle of the water column, seemingly useless for seismology. But we have a PhD student, Daniel Mara, who's currently working on ways to use these recordings to track underwater currents. You see here the fundamental mode, the first and second overtones, and he's able to correlate the frequency of these vibrations with the velocity of underwater currents near the fiber. So even sections that uh, seem to be useless for seismology can be used for um, very interesting applications. Now let's look at an earthquake. And this is the image that we saw before. We have a very non-uniform response for this fiber. We have sections that record very high amplitude and continuous seismic signals. Then we have sections that record very low amplitude signals. We have a very clear correlation between the bathymetry and the detection capabilities or the, um, the quality of the seismic records. In red here, we see the slope of the bathymetry along the trajectory of the cable. We see that when the slope is flat, the bathymetry is very smooth. We have very high quality, high amplitude seismic signals. When the bathymetry changes abruptly, as can be seen here, we have very low amplitude seismic signals. 
Here we see various frequency jumps and modulations. We have sections that do not record anything. And this may also be a problem that is related to coupling. If we look at this section, again, very um, varying slope. Slope here varies significantly. And we see the harmonics of the hanging sections. Um, another interesting thing is the amplification inside the basin. We see here scattering from the edges of the basin, this X shape. And I'm going to elaborate on what we see here later on in the talk. Now, I didn't mention it before, but dust measures strain or strain rate, while seismometers measure ground motions, velocities, or acceleration. So it will be extremely useful to convert ground motions to strain rates and vice versa. And the common way to convert these two measurements is using the apparent phase velocity as a conversion factor. So here we have strain rate equals ground accelerations divided by the apparent phase velocity. The apparent phase velocity is typically obtained using an FK transform. And this is a 2D Fourier transform that decomposes the signal to temporal frequency and spatial frequency. And here we have the FK decomposition for two earthquakes recorded on the Toulon cable. We have here uh, two lines that uh, reference the velocities that we see here. The solid white refers to 500 meter per second, the dashed white line 250 meter per second. And we resolve these, uh, the velocities of these waves according to the purple curve. We see here the velocity as a function of frequency. So these are very slow waves, dispersive. We see that the velocity changes with frequency. And these are actually short waves. Short waves are uh, basically dominate most of the seismic signals that we see or uh, on our underwater records. They are very similar to Rayleigh waves. Uh, short waves propagate in the interface between the solid earth and the water column, while Rayleigh waves propagate on land at the free surface. The main difference between them is that short waves are much slower, not much, but somewhat slower than Rayleigh waves. And this helps us to detect them better. I'm going to again talk about it later on in the talk. <clears throat> now that we have the apparent phase velocity, we can use this equation to convert strain to ground motions or ground motions to strain. And what we did here is compare the seismic records on this section of fiber. This is 20 kilometers from the interrogator on one of the cables in Greece, three kilometers beneath the ocean level. We see the fiber here in red. We have three seismometers, one at the ocean bottom and two on land near the interrogator. And here I'm showing results for two earthquakes, magnitude two and a magnitude 2.7. In black, we have the dust strain rate amplitude spectrum and the different colors, orange, green, and dark red correspond to seismometer amplitude spectra converted to strain rate using the apparent velocity that we got from the FK analysis. And we see a good fit between the black and colored curves for these two earthquakes. So the conversion is robust, and we see a very good uh, agreement between dust and seismometers, even though they are not co-located. The dust records are somewhere here along the fiber, and the seismometers are placed here. Uh, you can see them as the green triangles. Now, what can we say in a more general fashion about the ability to detect seismic signals using underwater dust? And what we did here is plot acceleration power spectral densities, we see here acceleration PSD as a function of frequency. In dotted blue, we have the on-land seismometer near the interrogator in Toulon. And in orange, we have the ocean bottom seismometer near the end of the cable, again in Toulon. The solid curves are acceleration uh, power spectral densities that are obtained from um, dust strain rate power spectral densities. So we took the noise PSDs that we computed for strain rate on dust, converted it to acceleration PSDs using the apparent phase velocities, and plotted them here. Now, these curves actually constitute detection thresholds for earthquakes. Everything below these curves cannot be detected, and everything above these curves can be detected. So to emphasize this, we model the magnitude 1 earthquake and a magnitude 2 earthquake using the Bruin omega square model both at a distance of 50 kilometers with a specific stress drop and attenuation parameter. We can say that the magnitude one cannot be detected in this case, while the magnitude two can be detected. 
Now, this is a very important issue because we see that the values of these curves for dust and seismometers are very similar. So we can conclude that the detection capabilities for dust and seismometers are indeed very similar. However, we do need to take into account that the values of these solid curves is a function of the apparent phase velocity. So to see how the apparent phase velocity affects the detection capabilities, we modeled signal to noise ratios. And the way that we model these signal to noise ratios is by modeling earthquakes using the omega square model and calculating the signal to noise with respect to this, these detection thresholds. We have signal to noise as a function of magnitude. In dotted blue, we see it for the ocean bottom seismometer. It's not a function of the apparent phase velocity. For dust, it is a function of the apparent phase velocity. So for 570 meters per second, the signal to noise ratio is expected to be the same for dust and seismometers. For waves traveling at lower velocities, the signal to noise would be higher because the strain rate amplitudes would be higher. And for waves traveling at faster velocities, signal to noise would be lower because strain rate amplitudes would be lower. So for example, if we look at the magnitude 2.1, we would expect that the direct S waves will arrive at a velocity of, at a velocity of around three kilometers per second. And this will induce a signal to noise ratio of around one, so these waves will hardly be detected. However, later arriving waves, short waves or other scattered waves will propagate at much slower velocities and will induce higher strain rate amplitudes and higher signal to noise ratios as can be seen here. <clears throat> So we can say that we have better detection capabilities for later phases for slower waves. Now to further emphasize the importance of the apparent phase velocity in uh, determining strain rate amplitudes, we show here an example for one, one earthquake, magnitude 3.7 recorded in Greece. And we compare the records on two different sections of these fibers. One that records very low amplitude signals and another that records very high amplitude signals. We can resolve the apparent phase velocity for these two sections. For the high amplitude section, we can see that the velocity is very low, around 240 meter per second. For the low amplitude section, the apparent velocity is very high, around 1.7 kilometer per second. So we can plot the dust strain rate amplitude spectra here in black for the high amplitude section and take an ocean bottom seismometer spectra, converted once using the fast velocity and once using the low velocity. So when we use the low velocity, which corresponds to the high amplitude section, we see a very good fit between the black curve, which is the dust amplitude spectra, and the orange curve, the OBS spectra, converted using a very slow velocity. We can also do that for the second segment, the low amplitude segment, the dust spectra is plotted here in blue, while the ocean bottom seismometer spectra, converted using a very fast velocity of 1.7 kilometer per second, is plotted here in green. And again, we have a very good fit between dust and converted ocean bottom seismometer. The difference here is about one order of magnitude. So we can say that the difference between strain rate amplitudes that are recorded here and here are only a function of the apparent phase velocity. So this parameter is very crucial in determining the strain rate amplitudes that will be recorded by our dust fibers. Now, how can we use the knowledge that we accumulated so far and use underwater dust for earthquake early warning? So why do we want to use underwater dust for early warning? We can easily understand the motivation if we look at the Tohoku Oki earthquake magnitude 9.1. The first alert that was issued for this earthquake was only available when the seismic wave from the P waves arrived on land in mainland Japan. It took these waves around 120 seconds to arrive from the, epi from the hypocenter to the mainland. Only when they arrived at the mainland, early warning was issued because there were no seismometers, no seismic measurements close to the source underwater. If we, will, if we are able to use seismic measurements underwater near the source, we would um, increase the warning time by a few seconds, allowing for the citizens of Japan uh, to take more mitigation actions and uh, prepare themselves for 
the strong ground shaking. This is another example from a company operating in Canada where they use ocean bottom seismometers to detect P waves as early as possible for offshore earthquakes and provide early warning as soon as possible. In Japan, they also have a very high uh, quality, dense ocean bottom seismometer network, which is very uh, costly both to install and maintain. While DAS is a low cost um, technique, we only have to plug in the interrogator on the on-land end of the fiber. And as opposed to ocean bottom seismometers, DAS covers a wide region, a wide geographical region, while ocean bottom seismometers are a single uh, point measurement in space. And again, obtaining measurements in either one of these approaches um, near the epicenters offshore would increase warning times and allow for more mitigation actions to take place. Now, the challenges that we have with DAS is that in order to determine the magnitude in real time, we need ground motions and DAS measures strain. So the issue is how do we convert strain to ground motions in real time? And here we propose to use a local slant stack approach where we determine the apparent velocity as a function of time. So for every time instance along the dust time series, we determine the apparent phase velocity and thus we get different velocities for the different phases. We then use the same equation, convert strain rate using the apparent phase velocity and we obtain ground accelerations. The only difference is that now the apparent phase velocity is a time dependent function. Once we get the ground motions, we can determine the magnitude and stress drop using conventional methods. So here we have an example of a magnitude 2.6 recorded offshore Toulon. In the top panel, we have strain. In the middle one, we have converted strain to ground velocities. And in the bottom, we have the slowness as a function of time. Between one and three seconds, we have the direct S waves. And immediately after between three and five seconds, we see short waves, which have, they have a much lower velocity. We can see that in the slowness as a function of time panel, when the direct waves arrive, the slowness decreases significantly. So the wave velocity is very high. For the short waves, the slowness is somewhat higher. The velocities of these waves are much lower. You can also see in the color code that when we convert strain to ground velocity, the direct waves, which have a higher apparent velocity, are um, more emphasized. They have higher amplitudes because these waves travel at greater velocities. Here we have another example for a magnitude 3.6 recorded offshore Greece. And here we have the P wave arrival at five seconds, the S wave arrival at around 23 seconds. An interesting thing we can see here is that the press signal noise is characterized by very low velocities. And this technique, this conversion, actually helps us to suppress this press signal noise. We can uh, identify the first P wave arrival much better, and also the first S wave arrival compared to later arriving scattered waves. Now, I want to um, show you a cross section here, just one channel along the fiber, converted velocity as a function of time. We also attempted to do this conversion using conventional FK approach. And I'm going to show you why this uh, works slightly, slightly worse. In red, we have converted strain rate using the slant stack based approach. And in black, we have the same conversion using the FK approach. When we use FK, the slowness resolution is much worse, especially for higher velocities. So for faster waves that arrive here, and these are the same direct, sorry, the same direct waves that we have here. So for these direct waves, we see that the FK cannot resolve the fast velocity that they travel in. And this is very crucial for earthquake early warning. If you want to start determining the magnitude and analyze the earthquake as early as possible, we would need to use these fast waves. If we underestimate the ground motions, as we did here when we use the FK analysis in black, we would also underestimate the magnitude, underestimate the damage potential of the earthquake, and potentially delay the issuance of critical alerts. So the fact that we can resolve these fast velocities is very important and very uh, useful for early warning. Once we have the converted 
ground motions, accelerations, or velocities. We used conventional methods to resolve the parent, sorry, to resolve the magnitude and stress drop. And here we used the approach that I developed during my PhD. Uh, we can see here a comparison between observed ground motion spectra, acceleration spectra in black, and the fitted omega square model in blue. We have very robust and reliable fits to the ground motion uh, spectra. We did this for eight earthquakes recorded offshore France and Greece, and found a very good agreement between DAS magnitudes and seismometer magnitudes. This is for S waves and again for dust stress drops and seismometer stress drops. So a very good agreement between the parameters obtained using underwater dust and on land and underwater seismometers. So to conclude the first part of the talk, when we looked at uh, the noise BSDs, we saw various noise sources, surface gravity waves, micro seisms. We saw the response of the resonance, the short waves that propagate in the basin. We also saw hanging sections. Um, we see that the bathymetry dictates the measurement quality. And our interpretation of this uh, observation is that the smooth bathymetry corresponds to regions where sediments would accumulate. And this will result in two things. First of all, we have a favorable coupling between the fiber and the ocean bottom, because in this region, sedimentation can even bury the fiber. And because sediments are characterized by low seismic velocities, we would also have low apparent velocities and higher strain or strain rate amplitudes. We saw a good agreement between dust converted signals and adjacent seismometer records. And this here in red is the major take home message from this part of the talk. <clears throat> we saw similar detection capabilities for underwater dust and for seismometers. We do need to take into account that they are highly affected by the apparent phase velocity. So we would have better detection for later phases for short waves and other scattered waves. <clears throat> and we also have better detection for underwater dust compared with on land because short waves propagate slower than Rayleigh waves. We saw early warning applications. Slant stacks allow for a robust time dependent conversion of strain to ground motions. And we saw good agreement between dust and seismometer magnitude and stress drops. This is something I didn't show because we don't have uh, much data, but this approach works well for both P and S waves. And the fact that it works well for P waves is critical for early warning because again, we want to use the earliest arrivals as possible. So before I continue to the second part of the talk, I only I want to show <coughs> a few additional results. This is a result from a paper that was uh, recently submitted. It's currently under review, but the preprint is already available. Um, a work by Martin Vandenen a self-supervised deep learning approach for signal denoising and coherence enhancement for underwater dust. So on the left, we see the original, the raw seismic data. We have the S wave uh, wavefront that arrives here. We can hardly see the P waves within all this noise, but when we apply this deep learning approach, we can see the P waves, we can resolve them. Um, we can also see the direct S wave arrivals much more clearly, um, basically see the signal in a much more coherent manner. Another uh, example, and this is uh, something that we are currently working on, so hopefully we'll get to see more results in the future, T waves. So T waves, for those of you who don't know, are waves, acoustic waves that propagate in the water column. They are generated because of the interactions between body waves and complex bathymetry. Here we see an example, just five seconds of how these waves look like. So we have distance as a function of time. We see this very clear move out, very uniform. When we look at the FK diagram, we see that the waves travel at around 1.5 kilometer per second, the acoustic speed of uh, pressure waves in the water. We see this very nice uh, beam in the FK. We analyzed four different earthquakes. All of them occurred um, on the Algerian coast. Using simple ray tracing, we were able to determine that the source of the T waves is on the Algerian coast for these four earthquakes. So basically, these earthquakes, these earthquakes occurred. The body and surface waves emitted by these earthquakes um, generated T waves on the Algerian coast. 
And these waves propagated all the way from North Africa across the Mediterranean and were recorded by our dust array, dust data, dust, sorry, fiber, offshore too long. Uh, so hopefully you'll hear more about it in the future. Now for the second and shorter part of the talk, I'm going to show you an example, the initial results actually, of our uh, effort to image an underwater structure offshore metony in uh, offshore Greece. So just to mention a few previous studies, um, in the past year and a half, there were two papers that came out that um, resolved the shear wave velocity beneath the fibers. This is an example from Japan where they used uh, almost 50 kilometers of fiber. And this is another example um, from California where they used about 18 kilometers of fiber and correlated their findings with a geological structure that is known beneath the, the fiber. Our data, um, we were only able to use a very short segment of fiber, shorter than three kilometers. We already saw this image before. We have waves propagating in the basin in Metony Bay. We have here the S wave arrival. We see waves that are bouncing from the edges of the basin. We also see press signal noise, press signal uh, ambient short waves that propagate in the basin continuously. So we have two types of waves in the basin. We have surface gravity waves. We can see them here when we um, apply the FK transform, we can see that their velocity is very, very low, slower than 15 meter per second. And we have short waves at higher frequencies. This is at about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Hertz. And the short waves uh, are at around one to four Hertz. We see that they have significantly higher velocities, uh, faster than 200 meter per second. Now, these short waves are generated as a result of surface gravity wave interactions. We can also see that when we track the power spectral densities of these waves, we see here the PSD of surface gravity waves as a function of time. Uh, the short wave PSD closely follows that of surface gravity waves. At this point, on the 22nd of April, there was a storm in Metony, which causes surface gravity wave amplitudes to increase. And as a result, short wave amplitudes also increased. Now, we used the multi channel analysis of surface wave method, the MASW, to image the velocity structure beneath the basin. So, the framework of this method is as follows we take ambient noise recorded on our fiber, we computed stacked cross correlations in very short cable sections along the fiber. And here, to remind you, we only have a fiber that's less than three kilometers. We want to be able to resolve very fine features beneath the fiber. So we took very short sections of 300 and 600 meters. Then we computed the F, uh, FK transform to resolve the dispersion curves. Here we see the fundamental mode in blue and the first higher mode in black. For some cable segments, we were also able to resolve the third uh, mode, so the second higher mode. Then we uh, perform the 1D model inversion, where the objective function is to minimize the misfit between the phase velocity and um, between the dispersion curve that's shown here as a phase velocity as a function of frequency. These model dispersion curves are a function of the velocity model. You see here depth as a function of S wave velocity. We can quite robustly resolve the velocity model up to a depth of almost 150 meters. But the velocity of the bedrock, uh, we could not resolve it reliably using uh, dust. For this end, we used two on-land stations that we had near the interrogator that were actually sitting on the bedrock formation. Now, from this 1D model, um, we computed a 2D shear wave velocity model. And the way that we did that is taking this robust 1D model and then going to the next sections along the fiber. So this model was computed at channel 40. Then we went to 41, 42, 43, and so on. And we allowed adjacent models to vary by plus minus 10%. So each parameter here, the depth and the S wave velocity was allowed to change by 10%. Uh, and in this way, we we're able to receive a smoothed but still robust S wave velocity model along this fiber. So what we see here, basically two and a half kilometers 
along the basin, and we were able to resolve very fine features along this short fiber segment. In addition to the Xi wave velocity model, we have a PSD image, um, an autocorrelation image, and these two are related because the PSD is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation. And we also have an earthquake record, a magnitude two recorded 37 kilometers from the fiber. We see several features that are dominant for all these panels. We see reflections <coughs> from the dipping edges of the basin. We also see them here for the velocity model. And we see these reflections at the autocorrelation image and for the earthquake signal as well. And in the middle of the model, we have a low velocity zone that's clearly seen with the Xi wave velocity model. It's seen for the PSD, autocorrelation image, and again for the earthquake. And this can either be a fault or an underwater channel. Unfortunately, we don't have much ground truth uh, to rely on in this case. Um, and our next step is to conduct simulations um, of waves propagation inside the Xi wave velocity model that we have here to recreate this observation, this beautiful PSD image. I'm showing you an example from previous paper in 2004 that did simulations in a similar basin. And we already see that the image is very similar. So to conclude this part of the talk, we saw that uh, we have shortwave propagating in the underwater basin in Meton Bay. We have induced, they are induced by surface gravity waves. We use the multi-channel analysis of surface wave to reveal the basin shape and the velocity model. We have a very sharp contrast here between the bedrock, 1.8 kilometer per second, and the overlying layer, which it has a velocity of around 400 meter per second. But overall, we can say that uh, using DAS for imaging is a very low cost technique that allows us to resolve very fine scale features. Um, it's very low cost because we only plugged in the interrogator on the on-land end of the fiber, let it stay there for five days and analyze the ambient noise. No need for underwater installation of expensive equipment or uh, active experiments. So what's next? Uh, as I said, simulating waves inside the basin. We have a PhD student that's currently working on ocean wave interactions and the generation of micro seismic noise. Uh, we still want to push further the issue of earthquake early warning, study low frequency strain. And this is something that we just started working on. We're still not sure if what we're seeing with low frequency dust strain records are a result of pressure or temperature variations. Uh, we, want, we want to monitor underwater landslides, study marine mammals, and the list can go on and on because the potential applications of this new technique are seemingly endless. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Itzhak. It's, uh, I always enjoy your work very much. You're kind of uh, peeling back the layers of DAS and kind of showing us how different it is from standard seismology. Um, I like that quite a lot. Um, so please, uh, as kind of Casey prompted, throw your questions into the Q and A. Um, we have we have one uh, right off the bat um, from Ross Henderson. He says, "Thanks, Sitzak. Uh, I was recently told that a DAS interrogator similar to yours, with the fiber dropped from a submersible vehicle to a depth of one to two kilometers, would cost around two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Is this true? I don't know." <laughs> we used fibers that were already deployed there. Um, actually, Anthony Slade is currently deploying a fiber offshore the Nice airport. So it's very shallow. It's only 20 meters. So the cost is much lower. But uh, we still need to bury it to make sure that fishing operations doesn't hurt the fiber. I'm not sure about the cost, but if you want, you can contact him and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to help. Um, I, I have a question about, uh, well, while we still uh, kind of uh, throwing open the gates for the questions to flood in, um, I have a question about the first part of the talk. Uh, so the apparent velocity that you found um, kind of, it has to do with this kind of great finding between uh, the detection capabilities of DAS with regards to the different phase velocity. Yeah, so I think there's been a, so you can say a lot about this kind of ability to discriminate different phases and that DAS, I think the statement that you have is like slower, slower wave speeds are more easily detected than the faster wave speeds of body waves. And so you're kind of 
discussing the difference between body waves and, and Schulte waves. But um, I guess my question is, this also has to do with the angle of the cable, right? Because it's the apparent velocity that we're talking about here. So yeah. in, in terms of an earthquake early warning application or framework, what is the implication there? Like, should we actually be designing our DAS arrays to be pointed towards the source of earthquakes to bit to better be able to detect them from a signal to noise standpoint or what, what's your feeling on kind of this angle dependence too yes yeah, so because we're talking about underwater the signal is is dominated by short waves and we see it here in the fk we also saw it um where am i going we also saw it here immediately after the S waves, we have short waves. So short waves are um, basically, they, they propagate in various directions. So this is something that we saw from, from almost all of our FK plots. So we can say that it's quite easy to record them regardless of the orientation of the fiber. And we see it as well for P waves because P waves on horizontal fibers theoretically should not be detected, but we were able to resolve their magnitude because we were, we were basically analyzing the short waves. So I think we're kind of lucky because it doesn't matter because we're working with short waves and in a way a bit unlucky because we still need the direct waves to determine the location of the earthquake. Yeah. But I think in, in this case, the orientation is more important to determining the location of the earthquake to have some interesting geometry for beam forming rather than for a magnitude estimation. OK, so uh, Anne Sheehan asks, what is the longest cable length that you have used? What is the upper limit length that is usable? I.e., are we restricted to near shore? Thanks and great talk. So we are restricted to the first repeater. If we don't have the first repeater, uh, we are restricted by the interrogator. So like you can see here, the noise generally increases towards the end of the fiber. So this is at around uh, 40 kilometers. You already see that the uh, secondary microsystems are masked. Um, it's really a function of the interrogator. I know that people are working on more advanced interrogators that they claim can reach 100 kilometers and more. Um, I haven't seen results from these fibers yet. Um, but I'm sure that with technological advances, the noise floor will decrease and we can interrogate the fiber uh, to a longer distances. The main issue with using telecommunication cables is still the repeaters that are in uh, less than 100 kilometers. Uh, Bob Woodward asks, when you compared magnitude estimates based on DAS versus OBS, is the length of fiber you are interrogating trade off with the robustness of the DAS magnitude estimate. So I'm just trying to find it. Okay. So the length of the fiber is <clears throat> it's more problematic when we want to resolve the velocity of fast waves because if we're doing it with very short fiber segments, the slowness resolution is very poor. Um, here I used around the 29 channels <clears throat> and stacked their, uh, the, the method uses the RMS. So I calculated the RMS and stacked the RMS to have more stable estimate. And 29 was enough for all the fiber segments and all the earthquakes. And these are uh, low magnitude earthquakes at great distances. So uh, it wasn't really a problem. The main issue is that we need to find a trade-off between the, the wavelength that we are interested in, the section of fiber, and we also have an assumption that, that we are dealing with a single plane wave. So uh, the sections should be short for that assumption to hold. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of uh, consideration to take into account. Um, yeah, I think there's but, also but the kind main, of this aspect yeah. of, noise, of noise increasing as a function of interrogator length, like you said in the previous response to Anne's, Anne's question. Yeah, and kind the, of end, the end of the cable is going to be harder than the beginning, maybe. For sure. And we also have the problem of coupling that we don't have uh, very long segments that record continuous signals. And that's specifically for our cables. If you use cables that are intended for this, you don't have that problem. 
Uh, very good. So David Hill asks, what gauge length was used and was it chosen for the frequencies of interest? Was it kind of tuned? So for Toulon, we use 10 meters. For uh, Nestor and HCML, the two cables in Greece, we use 20 meters. Um, they're tuned for seismic waves that are uh, much longer than, uh, than this gauge length. There's a couple of questions coming into the chat. Let me see what is missing. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Good. So, uh, Andres uh, asks: Seismometer versus strain rate DAS response showed higher noise floor on the low DAS frequencies uh, at that lower frequency range. Have you have you run strain DAs system, oh, DAS systems? Uh, those I use may have richer spectra at frequencies that are needed for your analysis. Great presentation. So strain, I think that means uh, like the difference between a Brillouin system that's measuring absolute strain versus a DAS mm. system. Yeah, so we lower didn't, frequencies. We didn't go so low. Uh, the PSDs that I calculated don't go um, as low. <clears throat> um, there's a recent, in the paper by Ide that I showed, uh, sorry, this earthquake on the right, they also show an analysis of uh, low frequency, very low frequency. Um, they resampled the signal at five minutes and they were able to resolve underwater um, patterns that they interpret as temperature variations due to currents. There is still the issue of absolute strain. It's not absolute strain, it's relative to uh, the previous samples. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think it kind of points towards this uh, potential, you know, uh, complementary nature of, of using many different fiber optic methods. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's possible to use DAS for these longer periods. But uh, so Feng Feng Chang asks, uh, nice talk uh, for the part two. I am curious about the reflector observed in the PSD and the autocorrelation. Uh, it looks like the patterns only occur at two ends of the cable. Could it be associated with the geometry of the cable? For example, higher curved end sections. Any thoughts about that? Like, could this be the curve, the geometry curvature of the cable used? It could be the geometry curvature, but also the, the problem with this area is that this uh, basin was only studied for archaeological purposes because apparently there's a lot of ruins at the bottom of the basin, but it wasn't really studied for geological or geophysical purposes. So we have a geological map that shows us the formations on land. And we know that there should be a decrease of the bedrock towards the basin, and then an increase when we get out of the basin. Because here you have a continuation of limestone formations that are some of the, in some sections that are underwater. So we do expect the basin to, um, the layers in the basin to go up towards the edges. It can also be an effect of the curvature of the fiber. Uh, we don't have additional information, so we, we can't determine for sure. That sounds good. So, so did they use the DAS for the archaeology at all? No. No, we They're actually not, uh, asked trying to them. identify ships for the DAS yet. They use the I don't remember which technique, but they only penetrated to a few meters. I don't remember if it was a ground penetrating radar or another technique, but the fiber is deployed there from before they did their experiment and they say that they didn't see it. So at least we know it's buried inside the basin. Yeah, I see. It's, it's funny how you use outside evidence to, to think about cables. <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, Megan asks, in your shallow subsurface imaging of the Mithani Basin, you mentioned that the low velocity zone may be indicative of a fault or a channel there in that section uh, in the center. Will there be a way you can determine what is what it is exactly to apply it to other similar anomalies? Will you be able to figure this out? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm afraid not because yeah. maybe when we use a newer interrogator, here we used a, <clears throat> a prototype which had the relatively high noise floor. Maybe if we use a newer interrogator, we would be able to go to lower frequencies and maybe better resolve 
what's going on here. But I, I think that I'm going to stay with an open question on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to get ideas back. from anyone that, uh, that has more experience with this. Uh, Ying Ting Li asks, noise levels at different channels um, are different. In addition to coupling issues, what else will affect the noise? Okay, so this is um, an interesting but very technical issue. So the low frequency noise that you see here, I guess we're talking about these variations, are a function of the reference update of the interrogator itself. So every few seconds, um, the interrogator updates its uh, well, reference level and it changes along the fiber and in time. Um, we can see a similar pattern for the high frequencies. Um, was there another part to the question? Sorry. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of a source of the noise. Uh, yeah, in, in this case, it's, it's mainly the interrogator that's yeah. causing the noise. Yeah. I um, guess splices would also cause noise. Maybe this is what we see here, but mm. we don't know for sure. Splices, I mean, uh, when we take two fibers and connect them. Um, I had a question about the T phase observations. So you made these observations from a few earthquakes and the observations were seen uh, many degrees away from the DAS cable. Um, so does that mean that, I mean, so how, how often do, are you seeing T phase arrivals? Like, is it continuous that you just see kind of energy moving out in this beam at 1500 meters per second? Is this all from just noise you know, everywhere or? No, it's only, only when earthquakes, earthquakes are occurring. On, only when earthquakes. And the only earthquakes from North Africa, we try to see if we have T waves from earthquakes occurring close to, uh, to Spain, to Madrid, and we didn't see, sorry, not Madrid, Barcelona, close to uh, the Spanish coast, and we didn't see anything. Um, we are still interpreting these uh, observations and not entirely sure, but uh, they are generated by earthquakes. That's for sure. Yeah. A uh, couple more questions. For a magnitude calculation, do you compensate for fiber radiation pattern? We take an average uh, radiation pattern that's different right. for P and S waves. Um, suggestions but for we, channel we don't selection. Do... Yeah. Sorry? There's a second part of the question. Any suggestions for channel selection while doing this? Channel selection, meaning the fiber segment that, that we use for the analysis? I think so, yeah. Based yeah, on the so fiber radiation we, pattern. Yeah. We try to find the sections where the uh, value of the uh, amplitudes doesn't vary much. There's another figure I didn't show, but it's in the preprint. Um, we measured the variations in decibels between adjacent channels at specific sections. And we use sections where the variations were small. Uh, so final question here, Bob asks, if you could make additional measurements at the seafloor or in the water column to address outstanding technical performance, what would they be? What kind of additional measurements would you, would you propose? So for, for current monitoring, would be nice to have some current meters at the bottom. Um, pressure gouges as well for the same purpose. Because we are starting to look at low frequency noise, which may be either a result of uh, temperature variations or, um, or pressure. So temperature um, measurements would also be um, useful. Um, we had a thought about using uh, DSS in addition to DAS to, deter, to, um, to know if we're looking at temperature variations or strain variations. It's actually an idea proposed by uh, Jonathan Edge Franklin. Um, I'm sure I can think of more. There are tons of additional things to, to test. Yeah. Depends on what you're in interested in or sure. target. Well, thank you very much for that uh, excellent talk and for fielding uh, a, a really whirlwind of questions. Um, 
I would Thanks. appreciate it. Um, back over to Casey, I guess, to wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Lior and Dr. Lindsay. The recording will be made available on the Iris Earthquake Science webinar playlist. If you're interested in future DAS webinars, please join the DAS mailing list and check out the DAS RCN website. Thank you for joining us for this webinar.